Good morning. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, for that introduction. And thank you and the organizers for inviting me to participate in this conference. Uh, yesterday's sessions were terrific. And I'm looking forward to continuing our discussions on access to legal aid for indigent criminal defendants. Before I discuss the specifics of the Legal Aid Society, I'd like to talk with you and describe to you the background about the criminal justice system in the United States. The vast majority of criminal conduct is governed by individual state, not federal statutes, and the charges are prosecuted in state courts. So, in the U.S., the responsibility for ensuring that criminal defendants in state courts who are unable to afford counsel have attorneys appointed to represent them rest with the individual states, not the federal government. States have approached the provision of counsel in a variety of ways. Some establish statewide defender systems, others have required counties or local judicial districts to provide counsel to the indigent accused. Whether using a statewide system or a county-based system, a variety of options are utilized. There may be a public defender office, a non-governmental organization like the Legal Aid Society, a contract with private attorneys, or the assignment of individual private attorneys on a case-by-case -case basis pursuant to an assigned counsel plan. New York established a county-based system, and in 1965, the Legal Aid Society contracted with the city of New York to become the primary provider of defense services for those unable to afford counsel. Today, we remain the primary provider of criminal defense trial, appellate, and parole revocation defense services. The Legal Aid Society, which was founded in 1876, is the oldest not-for-profit legal services organization in the United States, and we are dedicated to one powerful belief, that no New Yorker should be denied access to justice because of poverty. In addition to our criminal practice, we have a civil practice and a juvenile rights practice and are able to provide comprehensive representation to our clients. We believe a non-governmental organization, like the Legal Aid Society, is the best option for provision of indigent defense services. What are some of the advantages? A non-governmental organization like ours is independent of the judiciary, the legislature, and the executive, and has more flexibility in how it manages its affairs. Because of our independence, We've been able to sue the City of New York to reduce the delay in arraigning clients and to sue the city about the conditions of confinement in the jails. More recently, in a class action lawsuit, we challenged the New York City Police Department's practice of unlawfully stopping and arresting New York City Housing Authority residents and their visitors for trespass in those housing units. Pursuant to our contract with New York City, we are signed at the arraignment. As a result, we do not have to fear that a judge will not assign us on a future case because of our zealous advocacy on any individual matter. We're able to use economies of scale and technology to assist in our representation. For example, we have set up video conference capability in each of our offices to permit attorneys to have some private video meetings with their clients from the jail, rather than make a several hour trip to the local jail at Rikers Island every time they need to meet with a client. I want to point out that we have offices in each of the New York City has five counties, but we have offices in each of those five counties. Uh, we also have an intranet system, which enables attorneys throughout the organization to share memoranda, briefs, and other legal materials and resources. A non-governmental organization can readily provide ongoing supervision and oversight to ensure quality client services. Individual case reviews by supervisors and group meetings to discuss cases, trends, and recent legal developments all serve to improve the quality of representation by attorneys in an office. During the years of practice since the landmark Gideon decision, which you heard Attorney General, <coughs> Assistant Attorney General West discuss, we've also identified some best practices for the provision of high quality service to our clients. Let me discuss some of those practices. We believe that having multiple attorneys handle a client's case undermines the attorney-client relationship and detracts from our ability to provide the highest quality representation. As a result, we utilize a system of vertical continuity so that the attorney who initially handles a case for a client remains with that case until the matter is resolved, unless it is a case requiring the expertise of one of our specialty units. If it is a case needing special expertise, the case will be transferred to that attorney for the 
duration of the matter. We have established special units to handle clients with mental health issues and co-occurring mental health and addiction issues, clients charged with domestic violence, clients in drug courts, juveniles charged as adults, and victims of sex trafficking. We have also formed a DNA unit to provide advice on cases involving DNA, as well as a digital forensic unit to assist with technology-related cases. An important component of any effective system are standards. And these standards must be established to govern the quality of defense services provided to the poor. The zip drive you will receive, I guess tomorrow, Jim? Yes. Uh, includes standards governing indigenous representation adopted in several states. Included in some of those standards are workload standards, which are absolutely essential. Even the ablest and most industrious attorneys cannot provide high quality representation in the face of excessive workloads. Throughout the United States, many public defenders labor under conditions requiring them to handle in excess of 1,000 cases per year. At the Legal Aid Society, as recently as 2010, our attorneys handled an average of 682 weighty cases per year, with misdemeanors counting as one case and felonies counting as 2.67 cases. Legislation proposed by the Legal Aid Society and adopted in 2009, despite the opposition of New York City, requires legal aid providers in New York City to have an average maximum of 400 weighty cases in this fiscal year and provided funding phased in over four years to achieve this objective. In any indigent defense system, adequate funding must be provided to enable the attorneys to meet workload standards. Effective representation is enhanced by early entry into the proceedings by defense counsel. In the United States, signed counsel is really involved during pre-court accusatory interrogation or identification proceedings. However, if a client or family member contacts our office, we are available to represent the client during these pre-arrangement proceedings. In New York State, because of litigation brought by the Legal Aid Society against New York City, an accused is entitled to be arraigned on the charges and have a bail determination made within 24 hours of being detained. In New York City, prior to arraignment, defense counsels afford the opportunity to interview the client. Sadly, in some parts of the state, Defendants can still wait days or even weeks before counsel is assigned. I think you'll hear more about that from Donna Lieberman of the New York Civil Liberties Union tomorrow when she discusses the efforts that they have been engaged in. As you all know, counsel advocacy can be critical in persuading a judge to release a defendant rather than holding an individual on bail that he cannot afford. And numerous studies have demonstrated that those held in lieu of bail after arraignment are more likely to be convicted and when convicted, serve longer sentences than those who are released. An additional benefit of the pre arraignment interview, the opportunity to discuss the defense strategy and begin preparation of the defense, while the witnesses with information are easier to find and the facts are fresh in their minds. Attorneys who provide legal aid representation should have sufficient qualifications and expertise, experience to ensure that they have the skills and knowledge of the substantive procedural law enable them to provide quality representation. They must receive intensive initial training, must also receive continuing legal education to enhance those skills and to be kept abreast of developments in the law. I'd now like to focus on two critical aspects of defense work, often overlooked when examining indigent defense structures, investigative and social work support. Because an investigation of the facts is a vital component of the effective defense, the Legal Aid Society employs investigators in each of its borough offices, and their work often proves crucial. Their investigations regularly lead to the retrieval of video surveillance footage that exonerates clients, the identification of important data from transportation cards, school sign-in sheets, and cellular phone positioning systems, and the location of witnesses who confirm, find alibis, or contradict complaining witnesses. Also, many times the work of a legal aid investigator results in the discovery of evidence of guilt that provides a sound basis for advice on pleas. The earlier an investigator can uncover facts that exculpate a client, the sooner the prosecution can determine that pursuing the case is not the best use of its resources. Similarly, the sooner a client is presented with the facts that inculpate him or her, 
the earlier the client can make an informed decision about the wisdom of a plea. Staff investigators are an integral part of a successful defense team and need to be included when planning and developing a legal aid program. Similarly, social workers play an important role in an effective defense. The Legal Aid Society pioneered the use of trained social workers in the Indigent Defense Office, and they provide critical services to clients in each of our offices. Among other things, social workers identify mental health issues, develop mental disabilities, and substance abuse problems. Advocate for alternatives to incarceration to facilitate diversion and develop mitigating facts that are critical at bail proceedings and plea bargaining and sentencing. Such efforts regularly improve our case outcomes. Our experience has taught us a great deal about providing high quality criminal defense services. As you develop and expand your indigent defense services, I hope the lessons we learned will assist you in rendering the best possible representation to your clients.